or the Washington University Libraries. On behalf of the University Libraries, I am honored to welcome everyone to this faculty book talk with Professor Patrick Burke discussing his book, Tear Down the Walls, White Radicalism and Black Power in 1960s Rock, published by the University of Chicago Press this year in 2021. Now, before we begin, I would like to explain the format for today's session. You will only hear and see me, Rudolph Clay, Brad Short, and our speaker, Professor Burke. The webinar is being recorded and we will share it later on the University Library's website. We invite you to submit questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Professor Burke will answer questions at the end of his presentation. Now I would like to introduce my friend and colleague, Brad Sharp, who serves as University Library's Music, Performing Arts, and Film and Media Studies Librarian. Brad holds degrees in music education, history, and library science. Brad will now introduce Professor Burke. Thank you, Rudolph. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Patrick Burke, who is the music department's chair, as well as associate professor in ethnomusicology. Professor Burke joined the music department in the fall of 2003 after having finished his PhD in ethnomusicology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has served as the, the director of undergraduate studies and the head of musicology, and since this past July, has assumed the role of the department chair. In 2013 and 2014, Professor Burke was the guest scholar at the University of Oslo, Norway, and he has served on the editorial board of the Journal of the American Musicological Society from 2013 to 2018. Professor Burke's research centers on jazz and popular music in the United States with a focus on the relationship between music's performance and reception and the formation of racial ideology. His work has been supported by fellowships from the American Musicological Society, the American Scandinavian Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Social Science Research Council, and the Center for Humanities here at WashU. In the main, Professor Burke's scholarship focuses on hard questions. He looked unflinchingly at race in the New York City in his first book, Come In and Hear the Truth, Jazz and Race on 52nd Street, published also by Chicago in 2008. In it, he explores the period between the mid 1930s and the late 1940s, when the center of jazz world was a two block stretch on 52nd Street in Manhattan. In dozens of crowded basement clubs between 5th and 7th Avenues, musicians and their audiences defied the traditional border between serious and commercial entertainment and between the races. As 52nd Street was home to some of the first nightclubs in New York to allow racially integrated bands and audiences. Locally, Professor Burke turned his eye to St. Louis, which is notorious for its history of racial segregation, but also widely celebrated for its vibrant musical heritage and provides a significant test case for these questions about the connections between music and segregation in urban life. In his project, Music and the Racial Segregation in 20th Century St. Louis, Undercovering the sources, uh, Professor Burke combined the archives of both the WashU uh, Library and the Missouri History Museum uh, into a joint uh, database of resources that would be presented to scholars of music, race, and or urban studies and instructors at high schools and universities, as well as St. Louisans interested in cultural and political history. Associate, the associated online exhibit tells five different uh, stories from moments spanning the years of 1923 to 1949, when St. Louis musical institutions either perpetuated practices of segregation or sought to resist them. <clears throat> 
Professor Burke poses another hard question in his most recent book about the long tradition of musical borrowing or appropriation. On one level or another, musicians, it seems, have been obsessed by imitating in the best cases or outright stealing in the worst cases other musicians' creations or their styles or sound uh, since really since music began. In his newest book, Tear Down the Walls, Professor Burke tells the story of white American and British rock musicians uh, engaged with the Black power, political, and African American music during the volatile years of 1968 and 1969. It might be easy to suggest that these artists attempt to cast themselves as revolutionary were naive, misguided, or arrogant, but they could also reveal a genuine interest in African-American music and culture and sincere investment in anti-racist politics. Nevertheless, is it flattering? Is it demeaning? Or is it both? Here to speak to these issues is Professor Burke. All right, thanks very much for that introduction, Brad. I appreciate it. And then thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, it's a little disconcerting to be speaking to an audience that I can't see, um, but I'm hoping that if you um, either can't see or hear me, uh, one of the moderators will let me know uh, about that. And the first thing I wanna do is share uh, my screen. So please give me a moment. There we go. All right, you should be able to see both a uh, PowerPoint and see and hear me. So uh, if that's working, then let's start. Um, yeah, welcome everybody. I'm excited to have a chance to talk about my book, Tear Down the Walls, White Radicalism and Black Power in 1960s Rock, which came out earlier this year. Um, and what I thought I would do today is just kind of talk through what the book is about, maybe give, um, give you all some sense of how it's organized and what kinds of stories I tell in it. And then at the end, I thought I would maybe read a short passage from the book. So to start with, um, as Brad said in his introduction, this is a book about appropriation, and in particular about white appropriation of black music, which is a complicated topic. And it's one that has since at least the 19th century attracted a lot of controversy and a lot of conversation. Um, what I'm looking at in this book in particular is um, really two issues that interact with one another. The first is this question of appropriation um, of white rock musicians who are drawing on the work of African-American blues performers, jazz performers, uh, soul and R&B performers in their own music. And if you know, you know even a little bit about the history of popular music in the United States, you'll know that that's not an unusual dynamic at all, um, you know, that Again, going back all the way to the 19th century, we see that this is um, so common that in some ways you might call it the story of American popular music is um, white musicians taking an interest in what black musicians are doing. And then depending on your point of view, either imitating it, paying tribute to it, um, or perhaps ripping it off and making money um, from it, um, that black musicians due to various kinds of institutional racism couldn't. So that's one issue is this question of appropriation. The other is that during the period I'm looking at, which is really 1968 and 1969, you start to see white musicians who become invested in the black power movement in some way, um, or at least say they're invested in it, or at least make gestures towards um, supporting it. And what's interesting is that these two trends come together at the same time. So you have white musicians who are imitating black musicians, but are doing so in order to, at least again, as they see it, promote the aims of the black, of the black power movement, which is maybe not completely unprecedented, but certainly unusual. You know, the idea that appropriation would be used in an attempt to put forward what we might think of as an anti-racist um, political stance. So uh, that's, that's um, in the abstract, you know, sort of what the book is about. 
more specifically, the way that I that I approach the book is that I tell five stories. And so there's an introduction, um, which lays out some of the things I just said. And then the body of the book is five main chapters. Each of them starts with a story that happened sometime between August 1968 and August 1969. So this is very much focused on one year, um, a very important, I think, an interesting year in American history and in the history of rock music. So I thought I might just kind of talk through each of these um, chapters in turn. And for each of them, I have a little um, musical example so that you can listen to some of what I'm uh, writing about in the book. So we'll start with chapter one, which focuses on a rock band called the MC5, who are reasonably well known among kind of, you know, hard rock aficionados nowadays. Um, between 1968 and 1971, they put out three albums uh, that feature um, really, really hard driving rock and roll music and really loud electric guitars. So they are often seen as predecessors of punk or heavy metal music. They were also, uh, they're, they're from Detroit and then moved to Ann Arbor um, around the time I'm talking about. They were also associated with a political group called the White Panther Party, which sounds um, maybe like it's a white supremacist organization or something like that. And actually it, it was trying to be the opposite. It was a group of white radicals in the Detroit area who decided to um, devote themselves to supporting the Black Panther Party and were kind of hoping that their own party would become a sort of like auxiliary, you know, that this would be a kind of white auxiliary to the Black Panther Party. And the MC5 became the White Panther Party's, in effect, their propaganda arm. You know, they played songs, um, they made speeches, they promoted this idea that um, young white radicals and the Black Panther Party had something in common. Uh, and they also were very, very invested in blues and R&B and jazz music and, um, you know, played their own kind of fusions of those things um, in a very interesting way. And, and I think um, the music that comes out of all of this is actually pretty fascinating. The politics are a little bit confusing because, among other things, um, the Black Panthers were not all that especially interested in the White Panther Party. And in fact, often were very critical of them. You know, they thought that these hippies uh, playing rock music were actually making them look bad uh, to the extent that people were, were conflating them with the Black Panthers. So this is a chapter about this rock band and their relationship to this party. And the story that it starts with is um, at the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago, where famously, um, you know, police uh, beat protesters in the street um, outside the convention, and that was televised internationally. Um, the MC5 are actually the only rock band to show up and play for the protesters. Um, and this has entered into kind of rock folklore. Um, and so the opening um, of the chapter describes them, you know, arriving in this, in this very kind of volatile situation um, and playing their radical songs um, really while standing on the ground in a park in Chicago. Um, and to get a sense of what that might have sounded like, I'll play my first example. This is um, as you see, a song called Motor City is Burning. It is about the Detroit, uh, what some would call the Detroit riots, others the Detroit uprising of 1967. And it is a cover of a John Lee Hooker song. Um, so one of the great blues musicians and somebody also associated with Detroit. And I'll play you just the, the beginning of it. It starts with a speech by a, um, a guy named J.C. Crawford, who is kind of the hype man for the MC5. And you can hear him getting the crowd riled up um, before the band starts to play. Assuming that I can find the thing. Here we go. Brothers and sisters, 
Um, I hit the wrong button, but that's all right. Uh, it's about where I, was, I was trying to fade it out there. Um, so that's the MC5 playing Motor City is burning in 1968, uh, and they're the subject of the first chapter of the book. The second chapter deals with uh, the Jefferson Airplane, a better known band who came out of the San Francisco um, so-called acid rock scene in the 1960s, and were already quite famous and successful by 1968 and 1969. Um, the incident that I focus on and the story that I tell in this chapter, uh, you actually see a glimpse of here. Uh, in October 1968, Grace Slick, the lead singer of the Jefferson Airplane, appeared on the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, you know, a major network um, television show in primetime, wearing what amounted to blackface. Um, maybe it doesn't look exactly like blackface, but it's awfully close. And you can see in the picture here that she's making the black power salute uh, at the same time. And this is one of the things that um, kind of inspired me to start thinking about this book because I saw a video of this performance and I just couldn't make any sense of it. And it seemed like the most offensive, poss insensitive possible gesture a Slick could have made. Yet somehow she seemed to feel that this was also um, an appropriate way of pay paying tribute to uh, Black power. And in particular, this salute uh, in October 1968 would have been understood by people watching TV as a reference to the Olympics uh, in Mexico City, very famously. Um, you know, the two track stars who won the gold and silver uh, both gave the Black Power salute up on the medal stand. Um, and so this was a, um, a provocative gesture to say the least, while they're also performing a song called Crown of Creation um, that was all about sort of um, a revolutionary apocalypse. Uh, and so part of what I'm uh, really, all of what I'm trying to piece together in this chapter is just like, what was going on here? Why, why would you do something like this? Um, and it has to do with, um, the answer has to do with the whole history of the tradition of white women performing in blackface, um, which it turns out actually goes back quite a long ways. It has to do with the distinctions between the counterculture in San Francisco and the more kind of um, level-headed, less hippie-ish radicals in Berkeley across the San Francisco Bay. Uh, it has a certain amount to do with um, psychedelic rock and the kinds of um, stylistic provocations associated with, with that music. Um, and my argument in the final analysis is that um, as political activists, the Jefferson Airplane were um, certainly not effective and perhaps as in the case of this blackface stunt, um, you know, unhelpful and offensive. Their music on the other hand is interesting because it combines several different kinds of African-American performance in a way that's sort of unpredictable and I think genuinely creative, maybe in contrast to their attempts at political, um, at political speech. So uh, as an example of what they sounded like during this period, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble finding my cursor. There it is. Um, this is uh, the 1969 song, Volunteers, and you'll hear that the chorus um, uh, simply says, got a revolution, got a revolution. In the next chapter, I talk about an even more famous rock group, the Rolling Stones, and the action moves from um, the United States to London, um, where uh, the, the story I begin with is Jean-Luc Godard, the famous French New Wave director, had directed a film called One Plus One um, in 1968 that included, uh, it's a kind of um, montage of footage of the Rolling Stones in the recording studio, and you see a picture here on the left of Godard when he's uh, directing the film. 
And in between these um, clips of the Rolling Stones, we have various fictionalized um, tableau that are staged by Godard. Um, and to the right, you see one of these, and it's the most important one, and it recurs a few times, where you have um, Black radicals who are in a junkyard, and they are reciting revolutionary slogans, and in many cases, talking in particular about music um, and making comments about um, the blues and its importance to African-American culture and how white musicians are you know, stealing it. And so there is a real kind of like, um, the movie itself is a kind of critique of the Rolling Stones um, as appropriators of black music, even while at the same time, Godard's own vision of black radicalism is very fictionalized. And as you see in this, in this still here, very much kind of um, a fantasy, you know, something that he's staged. So it's it's a um, it's both a critique and a movie that deserves to be critiqued itself. Um, and the story that starts the chapter is that um, when this movie premiered at the London Film Festival, um, the Rolling Stones in Godard's original film never actually finish a song. You see them playing, uh, you see them working on the song that becomes "Sympathy for the Devil" um, over and over and over again. Uh, but it never finishes, which was part of Godard's notion that, you know, there was a sort of dialectical tension uh, where uh, creation is always about different elements coming together, but never quite reaching a, a sort of climax. The producer of the movie didn't like that. And so he simply overdubbed the entire song onto the end of it. Uh, and this made Godard so mad that he, uh, this is at the London Film Festival, marched up on stage, punched the producer in the face, and then stormed out uh, into the night where he screened his own version of the film under a bridge, now, which seems like a very sort of 60s radical thing to do. Um, and this was a period when the Rolling Stones themselves were kind of experimenting with, some might say dabbling in um, the politically radical stances. And a very famous example of that is the song Street Fighting Man from 1968. <laughs> So in chapter four, the MC5 return again. Um, and they, in this, this chapter starts with a very dramatic story where the MC5, since we first met them, have got a record deal. Um, they are on tour to promote that record. And they wind up going to a place called the Fillmore East Ballroom, which is the, in 1968, the main kind of rock music venue in New York City. Um, it's on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And the MC5 attract the attention of a radical group called the Motherfuckers. And I hope you'll forgive me for uh, saying this word more than once, um, but there's no way to tell the story without it. And the Motherfuckers are um, a group who um, are devoted, at least in principle, to kind of the overthrow of society, uh, starting with cultural institutions. So they did things like haul bags of garbage up to Lincoln Center uh, and dump them in the fountain. And you see here, um, they were also interested in kind of collage art. This is a collage that they created, um, a kind of manifesto illustrated with pictures that they printed in um, underground newspapers in 1968. And so these are people who see themselves, a predominantly white group of radicals who see themselves as extremely, um, you know, as, as revolutionary as, as, as much as you can get. And they're very skeptical of the MC5. And when the F MC5 get up on stage, um, they say that they um, did not intend to come to New York for politics. They just want to play rock and roll music. And this makes the motherfuckers mad. Um, the motherfuckers were also angry because they had hoped uh, for the previous two months or so to work out a deal with Bill Graham, who was the uh, promoter of the Fillmore East, 
uh, to use the theater for free for two nights a week. And their argument was that um, rock and roll was a music of their people by whom they meant the counterculture. Um, and that Graham was profiteering from their culture and that therefore they should be able to use this venue um, for free, at least some of the time, which Graham at first let them do, but then after a while he took that, um, he took that offer back. Uh, and so this, the night climaxes with the motherfuckers attacking physically both the MC5 and Bill Graham. Uh, Bill Graham winds up getting hit in the face with a bicycle chain, so this was actually a very violent um, moment. Uh, and the MC5 are forced to retreat, um, much to their chagrin in limousines that Electra Records, the record label, has sent to the Fillmore East. Um, and so in some ways, this um, destroyed their reputation as radicals because, you know, in effect, they had to run away from this confrontation uh, in, in stretch limos. Um, it's also interesting that, um, well, at least the argument that I make, is that both the MC5 and the motherfuckers are very much invested in trying to imitate black radicals to the best of their ability or really trying to imitate a kind of stereotype of groups like the black panthers and so the motherfuckers argument about rock and roll being a music of the people of the counterculture is kind of lifted wholesale from um the arguments of authors like amiri baraka uh, who were arguing that african-american music is the property of black culture um, so there's this kind of odd dynamic where white appropriators of African-American culture are arguing that their appropriation is actually their property. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's another one of these sort of complicated questions uh, or complicated moments where the politics, I think, maybe looking back at it today, often seems very naive. Um, but in the time, people were very impassioned about it and thought that, um, um, you know, thought that these questions about rock music and who owned it really mattered um, politically. And as an example of this, um, I have maybe the best known MC5 song. Um, oops, there we go. Uh, which is called Kick Out the Jams. Um, and it's from uh, like the previous song we heard is from their first album, Kick Out the Jams, released in 1968. And right now, right now, right now it's time to Kick out the jams, motherfucker! And then in the book's final chapter, um, I go to a much more familiar um, rock and roll um, event, the famous Woodstock Festival of August 1969. And I follow the White Panther Party, who you'll remember from chapter one, uh, to Woodstock, where they were hoping to raise money for their cause, and in particular for their founder, uh, whose name was John Sinclair, a poet and music promoter, and also the MC5's manager who had recently been sentenced to nine and a half to 10 years in prison for possession of two joints of marijuana, uh, which was widely seen, I think probably accurately as a political, uh, a politicized sentence. Um, he was being punished for uh, his reputation as the head of the White Panther Party. The White Panther Party never really accomplished all that much politically, but they talked a good game. And so uh, among other things, J. Edgar Hoover at one point declared them um, a major internal threat to U.S. security um, and had the FBI spying on them, um, even though that probably wasn't the case. Um, at any rate, so Sinclair was in prison, the White Panthers go to Woodstock, and it turns out that nobody's that interested. You know, musicians they talk to are kind of unwilling to play benefits for them or donate money. The audience just wants to hear rock and roll music. Um, and my argument in this chapter is that Woodstock, which is often celebrated as this sort of like crowning moment of 60s rock music, 
was actually when in some ways it starts to go downhill. And in particular, it's the moment when you have white musicians performing black music without the interest in African-American politics or black power causes that we see um, in 1968 and earlier in 1969. Um, so the appropriation continues, but the political engagement um, sort of disappears. As an example of that, I have um, here a song by the rock slash blues revival band Canned Heat um, called On the Road Again from 1968. And you know, this is this is the final chapter of the body of the book. Uh, the end of the book is an epilogue uh, where I talk about the ramifications of all of these issues um, for us in 2021. And in particular, I'm focusing on hip hop um, and the ways in which white hip hop musicians either have or haven't contributed to the Black Lives Matter movement and various ways in which um, and for those who have tried to make a contribution, I, I sort of assess to what extent that was successful, to what extent they're just kind of perpetuating um, older forms of appropriation and order, older stereotypes about, um, about Black music in the United States. Um, I think I will stop sharing my screen for a moment and, as promised, um, read a little bit from the introduction of the book, uh, which I think will give you a, a better idea of um, of, well, of both sort of the big ideas of the book and also a little bit about me. Um, I don't think I'm all that important um, in this story, but I have responded in the book to a common and I think very appropriate criticism of white scholars who talk about black music, which is that they never talk about themselves, you know, that, that their own position is kind of hidden or perhaps it's assumed to be objective or the only kind of position. So I wanted to say a little bit about who I was and why I wanted to write this. Um, and I'll read that section to you now once I've stopped sharing the screen. Okay. So, give me a little bit more light. This book is not as much about making whiteness visible as about rendering blackness newly audible in a music often understood as self-evidently white. As Jack Hamilton, who's a rock and roll historian, demonstrates, by the end of the 1960s, quote, rock and roll music, a genre rooted in African-American traditions and many of whose earliest stars were black, came to be understood as the natural province of whites, end quote. By the 1970s, the music later canonized as classic rock, despite its significant debts to blues, soul, and jazz, was performed almost exclusively by white musicians who often failed to acknowledge those debts. The attention paid to black performers such as Jimi Hendrix, Arthur Lee, and Sly Stone highlighted their token status rather than their centrality to the genre. The radical rock of 1968 and 1969, unusually, continued to acknowledge Black influence, musical and political, at a moment when that influence was disappearing from rock's public image. The stories that I tell here thus reveal that rock has to be considered in light of a complex interracial culture. Such an approach seeks to counter the cliched vision of 1960s rock as the soundtrack for a predominantly white counterculture. Hearing white rock musicians through a racial lens that makes their whiteness apparent does not inevitably perpetuate racial essentialism. Rather, it can reveal the interconnectedness of racially diverse musicians and audiences in the creation of rock as it foregrounds the centrality of blackness. I've also tried to remain aware of my own position as a white academic engaging a tradition in which I am a performer as well as a scholar. 
I have been a guitarist since middle school and my interest in improvisation and my love of such blues influenced classic rock bands as Led Zeppelin and Cream soon led me to begin playing, studying and listening to blues and jazz. At my predominantly white suburban Pittsburgh high school, class of 1992, I listened to the best of Muddy Waters or John Coltrane's meditations on my Walkman between classes. Black music for me wasn't about contemporary politics about which I knew little. Rather, it represented a kind of esoteric power that I could access through amassing used LPs, learning to play their lead guitar lines, and reading whatever romantic stories I could find about the musicians' lives. That I sought to enhance my teenage masculinity by imitating Black men did not strike me as especially odd, as plenty of my white classmates fetishized Michael Jordan or Chuck D. Throughout high school and college, I played in post-punk and hard rock bands that covered songs by Black artists, such as Jimi Hendrix and Smokey Robinson, as well as jazz groups in which I did my best to mimic Wes Montgomery or Grant Green. Although I remember once playing at a campus benefit for unhoused Philadelphians, the context in which I performed were almost never explicitly political. Nonetheless, I felt a sense of shared energy and warmth while playing at sweaty house parties and crowded bars that could be described as utopian. This book then represents in part an attempt to answer questions I've been considering throughout my life in music. One of these has to do with my relationship to black music. In the years since college, I have developed a more nuanced understanding of music's racial politics. Although I genuinely considered black musicians heroic figures and my love and respect for their music was sincere, my adolescent self didn't understand much about America's fraught history of racism and resistance. Now I understand that my performing and listening inevitably involve and continues to involve elements of misrepresentation and appropriation in new variations on what Eric Lott terms love and theft in an influential study. The white musicians whom I profile in this book attempted to grapple with similar concerns in complex ways that can be instructive even when they were not successful. Another important issue running through this book is music's potential to bring about moments of utopia. This idea has been explored in detail by Josh Kuhn, who describes audiotopias as those pieces of music that reveal music's utopian potential, its ability to show us how to move towards something better and transform the world we find ourselves in. Audiotopias in Kuhn's telling encapsulate and articulate the meaning of the meeting of different cultural and linguistic spaces, spaces both sonic and social, sometimes subjective and sometimes literal and physical. My early experiences revealed both music's power to unlock my individual imagination and the feeling of togetherness and mutual support that music can create between people. Many of the young people I discuss in this book had a palpable sense that music could change the world and the conflict they, saw, they felt between their utopian visions of society and their more realistic sense of music's limits continues to mirror my own. But enough about me. I hope that this book will be of use to white musicians wrestling with the ethics of involvement with black music, as well as for politically engaged readers interested in white musicians' attempts to contribute to black liberation movements during the 1960s. Readers of color and African-American readers in particular likely will not be surprised to hear that there is a long history of white musicians performing and profiting from black music. In this book, I relate episodes from this history not to uphold a triumphalist narrative of white victories over racism, but rather from a critical perspective that emphasizes these musicians' frequent missteps and insensitivities, often a result of their naive unawareness of their own privilege. At the same time, I seek to highlight those moments when white musicians considered black music and politics seriously and thoughtfully in order to assess the political and musical strategies that made such moments possible. And I think I will stop there and I thank you all for coming and I'll be happy to take any questions um, that you might have. And I think that um, if I'm correct, um, so, there we go. Uh, if I'm correct, those should go in the chat um, and I think uh, Rudolph will relay those to me. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Burke. And we do uh have a quick i'm gonna ask uh brad to jump in because i think he does have a question and then i'm going to follow his question with some questions that i have okay sure thank you pat i, I enjoyed hey, your, your talk this afternoon uh i guess i was thinking a little bit about the uh, the musical connections or the musical transformations if you will it seems that there's uh, if I go backwards a little bit, the, the, the similarity musically, sonically, between uh, a white musician doing hip hop or rap today uh, is in some cases almost indistinguishable uh, from, from a black musician uh, performing uh, the same or a similar style or a song. Uh, 
but if you know if you think about the the covers of you know Elvis Presley doing uh, 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 black uh, songs or any of the uh, even Prince or or Jimi Hendrix or 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 certainly the Stones uh, covers of so many blues tunes, uh, you would never mistake them as you know a blues uh, uh, performer. Uh, I mean a straight up blues performer. And I, and I just I wanted to hear your talk. Uh, not maybe so much about the political uh, mm -hmm. or, or what they were trying to do from that side, but musically, what what do you hear as similar or what do you hear as transformative or what do you hear as uh, aping or, you know, uh, from whatever perspective you want to you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, I would say um, maybe to your first point about hip hop, I mean, I think there actually is um, you know, for a while now, I think we've been in a moment where white rappers who attempt to sound black in a very sort of uncritical, unthoughtful way are actually really widely criticizing. I'm thinking of someone like Iggy Azalea, you know, who's Australian, but raps as if she is a black woman from Atlanta. Um, and, you know, for a lot of people, for, I mean, I think for a lot of, certainly for, um, I would say not exclusively for black commentators on hip hop, but certainly for a lot of them, you know that's offensive. That it is. That it is. A, it is a. It is a mimicry that is not. Um, it's inauthentic in a way that is um, a problem. Whereas you know someone like Eminem, I think is an interesting. I mean, he's obviously been. He's not. He's not young and and cool anymore. But I mean, but he's somebody who does. He's somebody who even in the way that he raps is always kind of drawing attention to the fact that he's not black. And so in some ways. Um, his sort of honesty about that makes him a more, I think, a more maybe creative figure and maybe even a figure who's better able to contribute to, um, you know, I would argue that his songs about the Black Lives Matter movement are interesting precisely because he is constantly kind of self-conscious about his own position and how, you know, he's an outsider who maybe doesn't exactly even have a right to, to make these comments. So, so that's, that's, that, that's kind of a digression about the beginning part of your question. Um, but the, I mean, as far as the 60s goes, I mean, you have, um, I think that a lot of what happens with these musicians is that they are, so the first MC5 example that I played for you, example, uh, Motor City is Burning, that's pretty close to a cover of the John Lee Hooker song in the sense that it's, you know, it's basically the same tempo, it uses the same kind of shuffle guitar part, uh, but they change the lyrics, which is interesting because John Lee Hooker John Lee Hooker's song is about how the uprising in Detroit was really scary. And so it's, it's from the point of view of a, of a person who's trapped in the middle of it and wants to get out. And the MC5 song is all about how, you know, it was cool. It was this radical revolutionary moment. And so they changed the words so that it has kind of a positive spin on these events. Um, and in, in doing that, they also um, pull the musical language um, away from John Lee Hooker's blues style and into this kind of acid rock style where it's really, really loud and distorted. I faded it out before the guitar solos come in, but they are much, much more kind of amped up. Um, and they're meant to be, and you know, it has to do with what they're doing to the words, you know, that, that it's meant to be sort of riling an audience up to engage in some kind of radical action rather than, um, you know, rather than telling a story about like anxiety and, and, and fear. Um, so, that, you know, that the MC5 do those sorts of, of changes. Um, they also do some more kind of unusual ones. I, I guess the Jefferson Airplane are interesting because they, I think, in contrast to the MC5, don't, and probably to the Rolling Stones too, don't make an effort to sound quote unquote black all that often. But the songs are just full of, you know, it's, it's, it might be a guitar part taken from Reverend Gary Davis, you know, he's kind of a country blues and gospel guitar player with like a you know a drum part drawn from you know elvin jones of the john coltrane quartet with a sort of guitar solo on top of it that's half bb king and half you know so it's it's this real kind of like fusion that is so complex that it doesn't actually sound like any one of the things that's that's being borrowed from which which i don't think absolves it of appropriation uh, of the i don't think it absolves them of the charge of appropriation um, but you know, even in the '60s, there were uh, some commentators pointing this out and saying, you know, Marty Ballin was one of their lead singers, and I have a quotation where someone is saying, 
you know, he's actually one of the more interesting rock singers because he doesn't make an effort to sound like he's a black singer, um, which you can't say of, uh, certainly early Mick Jagger um, is very much imitative of what blues musicians from Chicago were doing. So it, it's a long-winded answer to your question, but I, th I think the answer, there's a different, there's a different answer for every musician or group of musicians you're talking about. So thanks. Thank you. Patrick, I did have a question. Now, you covered it a little bit. I wonder what the, uh, in your research, if you come across what the blues artists at the time, B.B. Uh, King, John Lee Hooker, thought about their music being covered by these white groups. I mean, I guess in some way, if we could, if the politics weren't there, you could say, oh, well, you know, that's flattery that they're using my mm -hmm. music. But in this case, it would be, well, I just wondered if you, if you come across, if you came across what their perception of that was. And it, and it, and it doesn't mean that they're one person. I mean, B.B. Uh, King's perception might have been different than, say, another blues artist. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, somebody who, so in the, in the chapter on Woodstock, I talk about Ray, or Ray Charles and Joe Cocker. Um, I don't know if you know Joe Cocker. He's most famous yeah. for singing, you know, with, with a little help from my friends. This is right. a big yeah. Woodstock hit. And... You know, Joe Cocker is kind of like, he's an interesting example because the music around the, the sort of his band is not, doesn't sound like Ray Charles. I mean, they sent, you know, loud, loud sort of screechy electric guitars, the whole kind of 60s, you know, acid rock thing. But his voice is, you know, straight out of Ray Charles. And in fact, when he was younger, um, like he played in France for a while before he was a star and he was billed as like Le Petit Ray or something like that. <laughs> like he, he knew, he knew and everyone knew that he sang like Ray Charles, right? And so it's in this other context. Um, but yeah, Ray Charles, you know, in the seventies, um, I forget the exact day, a little bit after the period we're talking about, yeah, talked about how basically he, he you know, he, he'd been making this music and he'd noted, he doesn't, he doesn't say Joe Cocker's name. Um, but he says, you know, there are people kind of like doing my style. There are white people doing my style and making a lot more money than I am. Mm -hmm. um, and he says, he tells a story about how he went over to England, I think. Um, and he was like, oh, he, he had all, his, he was going to work with a band that was from England. And he had all his like arrangements with him. And the band said, oh, don't worry about it. We already have them. <laughs> so they had like bootlegged his music and were playing it already and, and you know, didn't even think, didn't even think to hide it. It was like, yeah, we're, you know, we're like a Ray Charles cover band. Um, again, not that there's anything necessarily wrong with, with being a cover band, but, you know, I think, you know, part of the implication is that, you know, this band was making money from Ray Charles's labor and creativity, not by adapting it, but by pretty directly just like trying to do it themselves. Um, and BB, yeah, BB King is interesting because he was somebody who, was kind of losing his popularity, like a lot of blues musicians was losing his popularity with black audiences by the late sixties um, because they're interested in Motown and Stax and funk. And so, you know, these older blues people are, they're still around, but they're not, they, they weren't like sort of like, you know, making top 40, big top 40 R and B hits anymore. And so BB King to some extent, you know, in, in, uh, he lived for a long time. And so there's lots of comment by him on this. You know, to some extent he credited the sort of, white rock fans was saving his career because they started booking him at places like the Fillmore East and you know, he'd open for he'd open for groups like the Jefferson Airplane okay. and audiences and audiences loved you know white audiences loved him okay. but it was weird for him because they loved him because he was this kind of mythical authentic blues man who they like revered you know he, he had there's this kind of stereotype expected of him that black audiences didn't have because they, you yeah. know, they knew who B.B. King was, they didn't listen to him yeah. since 1955, it wasn't <laughs> like he was. So there's, there's actually, it's not, it's not my work, it's a scholar named uh, Ulrich Adelt has a book about blues in the 60s, where he really kind of picks this apart, how, you know, B.B. King had to kind of figure out how to make his music. He had to make it palatable to this white audience, but he also couldn't make it so poppy that he didn't seem authentic anymore, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. So it's this kind yeah. of, he was really in kind of, I mean, he, it worked out well for him because he was very creative about it, but it also put him in this kind of bind where, you know, he couldn't, he had to be two things at once that kind of weren't uh, compatible really. So yeah, that's another long winded answer to a, a good wow. question. <laughs> no, that, that's, that, that's interesting. 
Well, I want to jump uh, in with another question, Rudolf. I, that yeah. got me thinking, are there instances where there are Motown or funk bands that are playing blues? So does it does it change when the rock band or the pop band is themselves uh, uh, part of that longer tradition? Um, um, I mean, there are definitely, I mean, funk and blues and Motown do overlap to a certain extent. I mean, there aren't a whole lot of, I'd say maybe funk, I mean, funk obviously is a broad category. It, it, it all get, the, the labels all get very nebulous. I mean, I think Motown in part was kind of moving away from an older R&B and blues sound. And there are definitely some 12 bar blues songs that Motown artists, I mean, Money by Barrett Strong, you know, which is the, yeah. the classic, kind of the first big Motown hit, that's, that's a straight up blues. But that's 1959, and by the time you get to like the Supremes and the Temptations and the Four Tops, they're not doing a whole lot of blues, really. Um, James Brown was, you know, both somebody who is a good blues singer and, you know, one of the inventors of funk, and so there's some overlap. Yeah, there's definitely, it, it's not as though, um, it's not as, obviously it's not as though African-American music was this like static thing, right? So it's changing, it's changing at the same time as the rock music I'm talking about. Um, I think what's interesting, though, is that in a lot of cases, like I said about B.B. King, white rock bands and rock audiences kind of want to think about Black music as a static thing. Um, like, they're not necessarily that interested in funk. They might not even be that interested in Motown. They like this idea that there's something called the blues that is really, you know, down home and authentic, and the guys who play it are the sort of macho stereotype of, you know, the, the blues artists and so on. And so, yeah, I think part of um, part of the story I'm telling is musicians, Canned Heat would actually be a good example where they, before they became a rock band, were these sort of like fanatical 78 RPM record collectors um, who could tell you like, you know, every country blues artist who ever did anything, um, but were not all that interested in what was going on around them in, yeah, soul and funk and, and current R&B. So there's a way in which it's like, they're trying to kind of find a, form of black music that they can work in and they do that by going to this kind of mythologized past so did that, did that answer your question sort of? yeah yeah thanks yeah. patrick i'll I will end uh, our last question it, it's for the uh, librarian question i was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the research process yeah because it's, it sounds like you, you interviewed uh, a number of, um, of musicians and, uh, but I just wonder if you could just talk about just the, the way you approach this as far as the research is concerned. Yeah, I mean, this is a book, um, I guess like all of my work, it's kind of obsessive micro research. Uh, and so um, um, the it's based to some extent on archival research so i went to the papers of john sinclair who's the founder of the white panther party um are held at the university of michigan and so that's probably the, the collection i cite the most i spent a lot of time going through you know his correspondence you know sometimes even things like when he you know when he was in, I, I said he was in prison you know in 1969 he was sending letters back and forth to the mc5 and they're all in the archive and so it's there, there's all sorts of information about the band and how he saw them um what their importance was and so on um i went to the university of connecticut that have the papers of a guy named ed sanders who's a poet and also one of the founders of a group called the fugs uh, who were a big deal on the lower east side of manhattan and that that, that comes into play in that chapter about uh the Fillmore east um, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has a library and archive, or actually a friend, a mutual friend of Brad and, and mine, Andy Leach, is the head archivist there. Um, and so I spent some time there, and they have a really nice collection of um, some of this. They have, among other things, there's a, there was a rock journalist named Sue Cassidy Clark, um, and they have all of the audio cassettes of her interviews with rock musicians, wow. which were like the basis of these little published pieces. But, you know, she talked to the MC5 for like an hour and a half and, and wow. talked to Justin Irving. Yeah. So I listened to those and actually got a lot of interesting material out of there. Yeah. So it's archives. It's also reading newspapers and the rock press, like really closely. Um, the underground press um, is really crucial. So, you know, the underground press isn't, wasn't uniquely 
interested in rock music, but it's one of the best places, um, you know, if you want to see what sort of counterculture, you know, hippie mm. slash radical types mm. thought about a concert or a band or a new album mm. that came out, that's, that's the place to look. Um, and um, I should give a shout out to the Wash U libraries because there are several really excellent databases um, of independent voices, I think is the one that I found the most useful where it's mm. got you know, hundreds of these underground papers, full text searchable and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's really great. Um, obviously listening to the, the music. Um, and so for each of the groups I'm talking about, you know, I spent a lot of time really carefully listening to their recordings. And that includes things like, you know, bootlegs that have been, you know, reissued mm -hmm. years later and that sort of stuff. Um, and some interviews too. So I talked to Wayne Kramer, who's the, uh, one of the there are two surviving members of the mc5 uh wayne kramer who if you look at the screen share is the guy who's on his knees uh sort okay. of center left um i talked to him for quite a while and he's a very interesting and nice person and I, I learned a lot from him um lenny sinclair who is the wife of john sinclair of the white panther party um i had a really nice who is very sort of supportive and interesting and you know of what i'm doing uh, I talked to her for a while and learned a lot about their experiences at Woodstock. Uh, and she's also a professional photographer. And so actually the photo oh. on the cover of the book is one of hers. Um, oh. so I, just, I should mention there's more, there's more uh, photos in the book if you like to, to look at those. Um, and Ed Sanders, who I already mentioned, um, I had some correspondence with about the Lower East Side during that period. So it's, it's not as heavily, my previous book on, on the 52nd Street jazz scene was based on a lot of oral history. Um, mm -hmm. This one isn't quite as much. I mean, I'd say it's more evenly divided between the archives, the you know, kind of periodical primary sources, and the these interviews. But um, yeah, but my my method. You know, people always ask what your methodology mm -hmm. is, or whatever. My, mine is just I try to find out everything I possibly can, any way I can. I, I don't know that I have a very uh, sophisticated sense <laughs> other than. If there's a rock that seems relevant, I'll turn it over and kind of see what's under it. So I've, I've yeah, there's a lot of, um, yes, it took a long time in part because I'm not a very quick writer, but also because I really was trying to like find all that I could before I declared it uh, done with. So, yeah. Wow. This has just been fascinating. And I know we've only really touched the uh, kind of the, the, the the tip of the, um, of the iceberg, but our, our time has, has grown short. Sure. Uh, Burke, Professor Burke, thank you very much. It's just fascinating. Um, so, and thank you for, for agreeing to do this. Uh, mm -hmm. It was uh, a, a great for this afternoon. And I'd also like to thank uh, Brad Sharp uh, and Lauren Strebel, who is our events and communications coordinator right behind the scenes for making everything work. I think um, Patrick has given us a, um, uh, some ways that we probably will alter our playlists because there's a lot of things that I heard that I'd like to follow up on. <laughs> sure. And for those of you who are thinking about your playlist of your reading list, uh, Tear Down the Walls, White Radicalism and Black Power in 1960s Rock is available wherever you buy books. The University of Chicago Press has provided a 30% discount uh, for the paperback edition uh, through the end of 2021. And um, if it's purchased on their on their website, and this discount code that you can use will be available in a post event email survey that we sent out uh, that you'll probably get tomorrow. So all, the, all of you that need register, we will send that out tomorrow. I want to thank everyone again for joining us today, and I invite you also to join us for our final fall semester faculty book talk. That's gonna be on Wednesday, November 17th. Uh, Assistant Professor Heather Berg from the Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies Department will discuss her new book, Porn Work, Sex, Labor and Late Capitalism. It will begin at 4.30. Uh, the registration link is on the library's website at library.wustel.edu under events. So our last heartfelt thanks to Professor Burke and for everyone else, have a wonderful evening. All right.